makes them have a high electron affinity. These oppositely charged ions are then attracted to each other, resulting in an ionic bond. When a metal transfers its electron to a nonmetal, that electron transfer results in ionic bonding. Positive ions hooking to negative ions. The second category of bonding we have discussed are called covalent bonds. When nonmetal atoms have a high ionization energy, they're not going to let go of their electrons. It's difficult to remove the electrons. They don't want to let them go. It's easier to share their outer electrons to create that stable energy level called an octet, the eight that every atom so desires to have in its outer shell. When nonmetals bond together, it's better in terms of potential energy for the atoms to share electrons thus lowering the potential energy between the nuclei. Shared electrons hold the atoms together by attracting the nuclei of both atoms. So here's this, a structural picture of a water molecule. The oxygen here up at the top and the two hydrogens down below. They're sharing a pair of electrons between them. The most stable arrangement occurs when I take those charges and alleviate any kind of potential repulsive force, and you do that simply by overlapping orbitals and share the pair of electrons. The third category mentioned in our text are called metallic bonds. Remember that metals have low ionization energy. They lose electrons easily. The low ionization energy of the metals allows them to lose electrons and form a simple sea or pool of electrons shared by many atoms nearby. That shared, pair, that shared pool of electrons are what makes metals such great conductors. The organization of metal cation islands in a sea of electrons where they are delocalized, in other words, this just means the opposite of concentrated. They are not concentrated around any particular atom, but allowed to flow from atom to atom to atom. This results from attraction of cations for those delocalized electrons. Delocalized means not near one particular atom, but free to move from space to space around it. In a metallic bond, we saw this earlier, just as a closer up picture, where the sodium atom, when it loses its electron, forms the ion. Na becomes Na plus with the loss of an electron. But these electrons are free to move around any one of the nearby sodium atoms, creating this pool of an electron C, making it a great conductor of electricity. When we refer to valence electrons, we refer to those as the ones being held in the outermost energy level. And the further away they are from the nucleus, they are held the most loosely, easily lost electrons the further they are away from that uh, core positive nucleus. So because chemical bonding involves a transfer or sharing of electrons between two or more atoms, it really is just this outermost shell that's of interest to the chemist. So therefore, when we start predicting how atoms bond together and start predicting the properties of molecules that we form, we focus in on the valence electrons only. So the Lewis theory helps us draw models, just little pictures using symbols and dots, to represent those valence electrons. And we have practiced this again in last semester. Using our periodic table, we were able to determine the number of valence electrons for the representative elements only. The column number on the periodic table will tell you how many valence electrons on a main group atom. Examining your periodic table, recall that we numbered our groups with A's and B's. Those representative elements represent their valence electrons. The representative elements are the group A tall columns on our periodic table. Take a peek with me at your table. Notice lithium is in group 1A, 
one valence electron. Beryllium's family group 2A, two valence electrons. We skip the shorties in the middle, those transitions. The transition metals, you cannot look and know by where they live, how many electrons they have. And we talked about that last term, thinking about why we need a Roman numeral. The next tall column is boron's family. Group 3A has three valence electrons, and so forth through the trend. By knowing the group A number, we now know how many valence electrons. The group A's are called representatives. The group number represents their number of valence electrons, and therefore the number of dots that we place around the symbol for making the Lewis dot structure. If you think about what we've said in a Lewis structure, we represent the valence electrons of main group elements as dots. We call those electron dot structures. We use the symbol of the element to represent the nucleus and inner electrons. As we use dots around the symbol to represent valence shells, here are the rules. We pair the first two dots for the s orbital. Recall that the s has one spatial orientation that can hold up to two electrons. The p sublevel has three spatial orientations, the px, py, pz. We place one electron into each orbital first, and then we go back and pair the partner. Taking this lesson of basic electron configuration into the Lewis dot structure says, we will create the dots representing the S cloud and the three spatial orientations for the P cloud. The first dot get placed on e any of the sides, they're all created equal. The second dot will fill that S orbital. Beryllium second dot pairs with the first dot. The third dot, again, on any side, fourth dot, fifth dot. Then I go back and give partners. When we fill an electron or configuration using spatial diagram, the S energy level places two electrons in the first cloud. The next three go P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, and we start promoting those electrons around that symbol as dots. Instead of arrows with lines, we're going to place it around the symbol with dots. 